that sort of thing in years gone by would have been incredibly time consuming and expensive to do. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, we're here again. Um, Utah, the next instalment. Um, last time we ended with the engine pretty much built and ready to go into the painted shell, um, which was a very exciting moment to be at. And now we, we start with the engine in the car. Now there's a, a heck of a lot of other detail to talk about. Um, but I will start uh, with some detail on the engine. So I think last time we'd got the billet um, cam covers here, but we hadn't done the final finishing processes on those. And we designed and 3D printed a prototype inlet manifold, but we hadn't had the final one machined. Um, and for those who are sort of catching up, we're, we're using Genvi Heritage throttle bodies, which are essentially a fuel injection throttle body that looks like a Weber carburetor. Um, and we just wanted that because we're trying to create an engine bay that has a bit of a vintage feel about it. We're not, we're not trying to hide the fact that it's a relatively modern engine. We're not trying to replicate a Jag XK6 engine, but we just want a nod to that vintage look. Um, so we designed the inlet manifold. That's now been machined, which you, you can see here. That was machined for us by um, Darren Alitech. Um, then we've had all of those aluminium parts anodized and they've just been clear anodized so they still have a silver finish um, but it just protects protects them and stops them corroding the spark plug leads that was something we touched on last time um, and that was something we wanted to make sure we got right in terms of the look um, to kind of really complement that vintage look about it um, so we're running a coil pack down here and then that's feeding up via the spark plug wires, which are just traditional silicon um, plug leads, but we've then over braided them with this um, woven nylon braiding. We've passed them down then through rubber grommets in a, a little plate in the, in the valley here that we've um, machined, um, or should I say plasma cut from, from sheet, sheet steel. And then they feed down to the spark plugs below. And we, we took a bit of inspiration on that look from the Ford BDA, which is a four cylinder, but it has that similar look with the plug leads coming th through um, rubber grommets in a flat plate and then going, coming over in pairs. Uh, when we designed the inlet manifold, we also put a little threaded hole um, in between every other pair of runners so we could have these little clips that clip them in pairs as they run down. Uh, it just makes a real nice neat installation of it all. Um, some of the other things we've worked on in terms of the ancillaries, the aircon compressor down there, it's the original um, uh, Toyota aircon compressor. Now on those compressors, they use a, a flange type fitting. It's basically an aluminium flange that's welded to an aluminium hard line. Um, and then it's bolted on to the compressor with an O-ring fitting on it. Now for the system we're using, all of the fittings are threaded screw-on type fittings. Um, so we wanted to introduce some threaded fittings onto that compressor as well. So we, there's a removable top plate actually conveniently on the compressor <coughs> that has the flanges for the original pipes to mate up to. Um, what we've done is machine our own little threaded stubs with the right detail for the o-ring type screw on fittings that we're using and then welded them onto that top plate pressure tested it all okay and then fitted that up so we've adapted that to run with the threaded type uh, aircon lines the power steering pump was another detail we actually really liked the fact that on the toyota engine it has this quite vintage looking pressed metal reservoir for the power steering pump so we've retained that um, the only change we've made is where it had a push-on barb for the, for the oil return line to the reservoir. We've, re we've replaced that with a threaded fitting and we've moved the positioning of that fitting to point the line in a convenient direction so it clears where our airbox is. While I'm in the engine bay, other things we've, we've been on with, the brake plumbing and clutch plumbing. Um, so you may remember from an earlier episode, we're using a Jag X300 pedal box um, 
from a manual transmission version, so it's got a hydraulic clutch. Uh, we wanted to make this look a little bit more classic as well. So for the clutch, there used to be a round plastic reservoir there. Um, we actually spotted that the original Mark II Jag type clutch master cylinder has exactly the same bolt spacing. Um, the push rod on the cylinder is a different length, but we've, we've retrofitted a Mark II Jag clutch reservoir and master cylinder into that X300 box and then just changed the um, push rod so it works with the X300 pedal. And that, that looks really in keeping there. Um, same reasoning on the plumbing. We've done all the brake and clutch lines um, just in a, a copper nickel pipe, which quite often we, we use braided, we use um, Teflon line stainless over braided hosing for all the brake plumbing. Um, because it's just does a neat job, it's nice, nice and easy to root. Um, but on this, it just seemed in keeping to use classic looking brake lines. So that, that's what we've, we've done. We've, we've just used copper brake lines in there. So it, it looks vintage and in keeping with the rest of the build. Um, so they're all in. The final piece in that puzzle was the brake reservoir. Um, where originally, we had the original X300 plastic one in there and didn't really have a, a plan to change that. But ha having seen everything else in the engine bay, it just looked completely out of place. It was, it, it was just stood out like a sore thumb. So we've decided to do our own aluminium reservoir for that. Adam's just in the process of designing that at the minute. He's drawn up a, a design we're all happy with on that. It's gonna reference a few of the details. So it, it's, there's gonna be a little bit of a nod to the finish of the um, cam covers, this radius around the corner. We're pretty much mimicking that radius and the way we've used these dome nuts to hold the, rocker, the cam covers on, that was a little bit of a nod to the original XK6 engine. And we've, we've translated that over in a slightly miniaturized form for the brake reservoir. So the brake reservoir is gonna have M4 dome nuts holding a, top, a billet top cap onto it. And that whole reservoir is gonna be silver anodized to match the uh, cam covers on the engine. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that come together. I think that'll pretty much bring the whole look of the engine bay together then. Also looking forward to getting the uh, throttle bodies in situ, which we're almost ready to do. I think the only reason they're not in at the moment is we've just got to finish the aircon plumbing because it was literally a couple of days ago that we were doing the modifications on the compressor for those fittings. So in a couple of, a couple of days time, we should be able to get that plumbing in, get those throttle bodies in, and that will more or less complete the look there. That will allow us to complete the fuel plumbing. Um, and it's worth a mention on that subject. Uh, these are the throttle bodies I was talking about. So they're a, cosmetically a replica of a Weber DCOE carb. Um, we've done the throttle linkage arrangement. We've had all of these in situ for a trial fit. Um, we've got the fuel uh, line layout all sorted and planned. Um, and that includes some little plates we made. We did these little plasma cut plates that bolt up to these original existing four bolt flanges on all three throttle bodies. Um, and they just have a little threaded hole in the middle here so we can put uh, clips along here to clip the fuel line where it comes out of this throttle body it loops around and back underneath to the pressure regulator which sits at the back there um, so we've made provision to clip all that into place and then the other the other position on those clips will be where the engine wiring loom comes along to feed the injector connectors and other parts of the engine management. This is actually the front chassis loom. Um, we've had all the wiring looms now done for the car. Now, these have been done by um, a company called Bremax, who we've used a lot recently for our wiring. Uh, there are various specifications we can go, go with when we're doing the wiring for a car. On this, and a lot recently, we've been mixing the specification according to the environment the wiring is in. So all of the interior wiring is not fully sealed. It's in a, a loose, um, sort of nylon overbraid. Um, whereas as soon as we come through any of the bulkheads to an environment that's exposed to the weather, we then go fully sealed. Um, so it's uh, Raychem Type 44 wire, uh, Raychem DR25 heat shrink, all the joins where a single branch splits out into several branches are sealed with adhesive lined heat shrink. So that's got like a glue inside it. And when you shrink it and heat it, that glue melts and completely seals that, that junction. And then it's completely sealed onto the connectors with again, adhesive lined shrink. And the connectors are all weatherproof connectors. So in this case, they're Deutsch DT and DTM connectors. Um, 
and that's that's the sort of spec that we run everything outside so the engine management loom will be to that specification this is the front chassis loom which comes through um, the footwell into the under wing area and then when we're in the metalwork phase we put threaded bosses underneath this wing along the in back of the inner wing that run all the way down to here and so we'll be clipping this wiring along there it feeds that light then comes underneath here there are more threaded bosses hidden under the front panel here it'll feed off to the aircon dryer and the horn here and then carry on to this side and feed the lamp on this side there'll also be a branch for the fan over there um, so we we planned all that out at the metalwork stage so that when we're at this stage we're not drilling any holes at all it's literally just clipping it all into place and it's all planned so it's really hidden away and you don't you don't really see any of the wiring same with the engine management loom things like those clips under the throttle bodies uh, to securely um, retain that wiring but also retain it in a place that's fairly hidden away so there's not really going to be a lot of visible wiring in the engine bay at all when we're done so that is that um, other things to note in the engine bay showed you before i think the air box this is the air box that goes over those um, throttle bodies there'll be a filter inside this box um, it's carbon fiber but we are going to paint this with a, a crackle or wrinkle black finish to match the cam belt cover and a couple of other details we've done in the engine bay um, and then that sits into a, an aperture in the inner wing which we we um, made when we were at the metalwork stage and then that's ducted through a hole in the inner wing here to this intake at the front here um, with a fabricated uh, duct that we made when, again when we were at the metalwork stage this side if you remember feeds another pipe which runs all the way back to the sort of kick panel area on this side and then there's a duct through for the intake air um, for the heater and aircon unit rather than having the pop-up uh, intake on the scuttle that these had originally the only remaining thing was the breathers we've done these banjoed breathers on the back of the cam covers here again it's quite a nice vintage way of doing it we could have done it with threaded air equipped type fittings um, but I, we felt they would look a bit too bulky now we haven't gone as far as fabricating the breather tank which is going to sit up here because we wanted to get the engine in first so we could work out exactly the sweep of the pipes running from those breathers to the tank so we could then put the spigots on the tanks at exactly the right angle to make sure the pipe routing up to that tank was neat and the, the pipes just came through a nice gentle sweep the gearbox is obviously um, in situ as well uh, if you cast your minds back that's a bmw m3 six-speed manual box um, we used an off-the-shelf adapter plate for that but we had a flywheel made um, by ttv so it's a ttv flywheel and we, i was quite specific in wanting um, a completely road orientated clutch in it so it's actually an original equipment bmw clutch um, for a non-dual mass model so it's actually a, a e28 m5 spec clutch which will be a similar sort of power to this engine um, and it's always nice to sort of call on the hours and hours of development that original manufacturers put into these things so we've used that clutch so that we can pretty much guarantee that the feel of the clutch is going to be very much as per an original equipment uh, car so it's e28 m5 clutch onto a bespoke flywheel um, which makes up the toyota engine to the bmw m3 gearbox we also had to do um, a shifter for that gearbox which is probably an opportune moment for me to stick this up in the air and show you some of that Okay, um, so yeah, gearbox, um, actually when we're under here we can also see the gearbox cross member that we made up for it, um, that's using the original BMW type rubber mounts on here. Um, this, as with all of the underbody steel components, has been um, blasted, zinc metal sprayed and powder coated. So the shifter mechanism, that's what I was getting onto, um, we needed to shorten that and when we did the, the dry build on the car, we essentially just did a very crude shortening of the original BMW piece, just welded it shorter so we could check that it actually worked and shifted at that length. 
um, but we never made the final housing for that. So we now have done, there's a fabricated steel housing that picks up on two of these bolts at the top of the casing here, um, and then also has a through bolt um, where there would have originally been the uh, fastener for the BMW shifter arrangement. We've got rubber bushes on all those fixings, um, then attached to a steel housing, which we've made fabricated steel housing. Um, and then we've machined a little spigot at the back of that housing, which actually takes the original BMW um, plastic bush. And again, we were keen to use the original BMW parts. There are a lot of cheap quick shift kits for these gearboxes available. Um, but the tolerances on them are absolutely atrocious and you, you often find them having horrible vibration noises because the, the ball joint just isn't tight within its socket. So we decided to use all original BMW parts. So it's got the original BMW plastic ball joint, the stick, which has got a rubber section in it to try and kill some vibration. Um, and then what we've done is do a shortened version of the original BMW um, linkage piece. Um, all of those steel parts have been um, zinc nickel plated and that, that goes for any of the, the steel parts on the underbody that we don't want a big build up of powder coat etc on. So usually bits that have got machine faces where there's going to be bolts attaching them, um, they all get a zinc nickel plated finish to, to uh, try and fight the uh, battle against corrosion. Um, so that's the gearbox shifter arrangement. Um, while we're under here you can see the uh, rear brake line running along here fuel lines this side which you probably can't quite see in that shot and then moving forward you can see some of the things that we've talked about previously so these steering arms um, we showed these in their 3d printed form last time these have now been machined in en16 steel um, by alitech again um, and they've been zinc nickel plated and then you can see also the rack mounts uh, which we talked about quite a long while ago a few episodes ago we went through all of the dry build of this and the, the tackling of all the various geometry issues that were raised um, by putting this, uh, this type of rack on the car. Um, and these are the, the eventual design we settled on, which again we showed 3D printed last time, but they've since been machined and then anodized black. Um, you can also see the brake setup's all in place now. So essentially that, that front cross member setup is completely finished. The only thing we've got left to do is plumb the power steering lines, but there's all plans in place for that. Just on the top of here, we've done threaded bosses, um, and there are also a series of threaded bosses on the front of this cross member, um, and they're there so that we can clip um, the power steering lines where they cross over, and also where the main power cable crosses over from the alternator to the starter, they will also cross over on those threaded bosses. So everything's sort of taken into account on there. Um, that's probably it for the underside. Uh, I'll just quickly drop it back down, and then we can touch on a few of the interior and exterior parts. Okay, let me uh, inelegantly step over the ramp here, um, moving on to some of the interior details. So a lot of this has just been putting together um, parts that we'd already planned and fabricated during the metalwork phase, but there's also been quite a lot of design and um, engineering work in terms of parts of the interior that we hadn't already designed at that stage because we didn't need to, to enable us to complete the metalwork on the shell itself. So in terms of the stuff we'd already planned, all of this dash structure, um, this tube that goes across here, the mounts for the heater, the mounts for the screen, all of this upper dash structure itself had been designed and fabricated at the metalwork stage. The only difference now is that it's all been powder coated um, and that's enabled us to actually fit those components. So we've got the um, vintage air aircon heater box over there. Um, that we've also got the uh, PDUs and ECU mounted over here, which I'll go into a little later. Some of the stuff that we have done relating to that since last time is, for instance, these um, adapters on the heater box here uh, are 3D printed unit uh, items to get the tight hose angles that we wanted off of that um, unit to then allow us to attach the ducts that feed the various dash vents. There's, there's a vent this side and then on the other side, and then we've got the demist vents at the top there. Um, there's a detail worth, worth mentioning on those. Um, these aluminium bezels we've just recently had back from anodizing, which allowed us to fit those. So they were drawn up and machined from solid aluminium billet. There's a couple of little details on those. We've actually put round bosses on the back of these of a certain depth, which 
uh, are just fractionally less than the depth of the leather and the foam underneath on this dash top. Um, and we've done that with a hole punched through the leather and the foam. So they actually bolt up tight. So it's metal on metal joint with bolts up from underneath into threaded bosses um, on those demist vents there. Sort of moving on to the rest of the dash, because we've essentially designed all of the main fascia panels before and they just need finishing with their wood grain finish, um, the bit we'd left to do still was this centre console part. And that's where a lot of the time uh, since the last video has gone um, is in designing this console part. Now we've done some basic drawings for it before, so we've got a gist of the look that we wanted on it. Um, and it's, it's going through that process of working out the exact detail of how that's going to be made um, and also the choice of components that go in there. So at the top on the, on the upper section here, there's going to be a row of six switches. Um, and we wanted those to be rotary switches with a, quite a vintage look to them. Um, we've got the switches um, sorted. And even details like this, it can be quite difficult to source exactly the switches you want. We wanted rotary switches, but they're two different types. We needed um, some that were three position for the wipers and headlights, so they have an off uh, side lights, headlights on the headlight switch, or off fast and slow on the wipers. Uh, whereas some of them are simple two position switches, just make or break. So for instance, for the heated seats, um, for the interior light. But of course we wanted them all to match and, and all have a nice quality feel to them. Um, so these are Indac switches, which I think are US made off the top of my uh, head. And then for the actual, look of it we've gone with these what they call chicken head switches which are more commonly used on guitar amps and that sort of thing um, but they've got a nice little machine brass insert in there with a grub screw which engages with the uh, the flats on our switches that we've got so we're going to have a row of six of those um, another detail was the start switch which actually we're waiting for that's being built at the moment in germany but uh, we wanted a, a substantial kind of rotary momentary switch for the start switch because we're going to have a, a essentially a larger version of that on a recess to the right here so your start button is basically a momentary turn of a rotary switch that you're letting that go and it flicks back again um, which was qu quite an interesting detail because it's not something i don't think i've ever seen on a car before um, so we're just waiting for that switch to arrive which will allow us to finish all the last bits of detail on the panel that's going to hold it of that has been James's work over the last few weeks and he's designed almost that entire assembly in CAD. So the fascia panel, I mean this was a, an early trial fascia panel, um, just plasma cut out really simply in steel so we could offer it up and check the dimensions and see how it sat in there size wise. Um, we've since then revised this design a few times after conversations with the customer. So these apertures are all slightly different sizes now. The detail at the back here is slightly different. This was going to be a cup holder, which is no longer in part of the design. Um, and we've pretty much homed in on the final design now. And then this, this piece, as it, as it will be finally, will be machined in aluminium. Um, and then it will be hydro dipped with a wood grain finish. And we're going to need to machine it because we want to have a, a quite a substantial chamfer in the corner of, of these apertures, which is a bit of a nod to the way quite a lot of the Rolls-Royce interior design was in the 50s. Um, where they had a black panel behind a wood fascia with quite a strong chamfer on the corners. Um, so we're going to mill it out of aluminium with a chamfer on all of those corners, um, then roll it to the curve and then get it hydrated with the wood grain finish. Um, that then has a number of components which are attached to the underside of it. Um, the forward hole in that has a cordless phone charger and this is a, a 3D print of the design we've come up with which will once we've verified that this fits nicely, we're going to machine in aluminium billet and it'll be black anodized. Um, this will also have a, a leather inlay into it, which matches the leather interior color on the car. And that's why there's this slight recess around the edge here because we've recessed it to the thickness of the leather. So when it's bolted up underneath, um, it'll all be flush. And then a cordless phone charger sits into here. So essentially this is a recess at the front when that's all assembled together. Um, 
where you put your phone and it charges um, as you're driving. Uh, there's a, a section at the back then which is this piece which has also got a leather insert in it. It's essentially just a little coin tray which will sit under here um, and this piece also forms two functions. It's not only that coin tray but it also supports the audio controls which sit on each side of here um, and then they'll sit flush into these grooves on our final panel. Uh, so you've got the, the sort of basic functions on your audio and sat nav system that you want to access regularly just fall to hand there's nothing worse than having to use a touchscreen which which to be honest seems to be getting concerningly common on new cars particularly uh, things like teslas etc where almost all the functions are done via touchscreen which is almost impossible to actually use while you're driving along without taking your eyes off the road for far too long so quite why they're going down that route i don't know but it's a great combination in this that we've got the touchscreen so you can do menus and uh, enter sat nav destinations when you're stationary but when you're actually driving the controls you need volume control track skipping switching between sat nav or audio etc can all be done just by buttons that fall really readily to hand just behind the gear stick um, so that's pretty much the the gist of our console design the point we're at at that now is just waiting for that start switch that will allow us to finish the design of all the framework that holds that um, we've already designed these pieces and we're happy with that. We've designed the fascia panel and we're happy with that. So it'll be getting the bits that we've prototyped in 3D print machined and getting the fascia panel machined. And once that's done, we can get all of the parts that are going to be hydro dipped with that wood grain finish off to be, to be done. Um, and once that lot's done, we can do the side panels, which will be much more simple. They're just going to be um, an MDF panel up the side here. Um, that'll be channeled out along the top to allow us to set the back of a French seam into there on the lever. Uh, and that will complete that console. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that come together because it's almost like the keystone of the interior design. Um, and it's the one bit that we've not really completely finished making all the parts for. interior progress going really well the seats were well, probably mentioned before they're xj40 daimler seats which we've used in a couple of other cars and they're just a really good choice because they they have a lot of modern functionality all electric heated really nice design with a sort of seamless um, horseshoe shaped leather panel at the front of the base rather than having seams in the corners which is actually matches really nicely the original mark ii jag rear seat design but the reason we like them is that as although they have all that functionality they're really quite slim looking nice classic looking seats a lot of modern car seats with that sort of electric um, functionality when you put them in a classic car like this they look absolutely huge they're just fat horrible looking things um, that look totally out of place and those seats are just a really nice sort of um, middle ground where they've, they've got the modern uh, features but they look quite classic so we've got those, we've reupholstered those completely. They've got these beautiful little tray tables that flip out on the back, which will be hydro dipped with the same wood grain finish as the dash and the console. The only modification away from the standard really is the armrest, which we've, uh, which is pretty much finished actually, yeah, that's here. Um, reasonable amount of engineering, even in something like an armrest. I feel like with an armrest, it would be possible for you to lean all your weight on it. So it should be able to take that really easily. So it's all metal fabricated parts. There's a, a boss that we um, bolt into the side of the seat frame. Um, it then has uh, a shoulder bolt, a really substantial shoulder bolt that goes into that boss. And then we've, this is steel fabricated inside here, um, sheet steel on the sides and around here, a machine tube running through here that's got phosphor bronze bushes in it. Um, and then there's a little peg that we, we thread into this machine threaded hole on here which engages with a milled slot on the boss on the seat, which sets the up and down positions. Uh, and then when this is all bolted up, there's a wavy washer um, that sandwiches between the two, which basically sets the amount of preload on the pivot. So you obviously want it to not just fall up and down, um, but likewise you want to be able to move it. So it's that wave washer that gives it some resistance, um, but still allows it to move. So even, even on things like uh, an armrest like that, there's a, a reasonable amount of thought and engineering going into it. The rear seat, relatively straightforward. It's the standard, it's a standard Mark II Jag rear seat. The seat frames were rusted. I mean, that's, that shows you something about the condition of some of these cars. The, the back uh, seat frame was actually rusted enough to need substantial sections welding into it. So they were stripped, repaired, um, 
trial fitted, blasted and powder coated, and then we've got new foams, which you can get off the shelf actually, the, the new foams for the, the rear seat. And then Dean's set about re-upholstering that in the same cognac leather that everything else is being upholstered in. Um, so that's a relatively straightforward part of the interior. The door panels uh, and kick panels, we tend to do this on all of our car builds. We remake flat panels that were originally like a hardboard material um, in ABS plastic, just because it seems much more logical to have a, a weather resistant, stable material. If you look at the original door panels of most cars of this age, because there's moisture present inside the doors where it runs down the glass and into the door cavity, you always tend to find that they get some moisture onto the door panels and they get wavy and warped and they're just not very nice. And to be honest, that sort of hardboardy, cardboardy material they use for a lot of the interior construction just really isn't up to the job. So we remake all that in ABS, which is done. They just need a, a layer of foam bonding onto them and then leather, leathering over the top. Um, we're changing the details on the door cards. So they'll, we're doing a, a, a basically a simplified cleaned up design. Again, the original armrest and door pocket design is just bits of bent hardboard kind of stapled around and it's really not a very nice arrangement. Um, so we're doing our own um, door armrest slash pull handle design, which references the kind of almost aerofoil shape of the side profile of the car. Um, and I, I literally just modelled those in some modelling foam, sculpt, hand sculpted it until we were happy with the, the shape, showed some videos to the customer, um, changed it around until we were all happy with that shape. And then we'll, we'll literally 3D scan that model of an armrest, um, use that CAD model to flip it and do the ones for the other side and then 3D print those. And the final armrest will be the 3D printed parts, um, obviously then upholstered in leather. Um, but that's another instance where technology is extremely helpful these days with the sort of thing we do, where we can literally prototype a part just by sculpting it in foam, scan it in, um, print it, and actually print it as a final part, um, ready to be upholstered. And, and that sort of thing in years gone by would have been incredibly time consuming and expensive to do. Um, and actually that, that sort of rapid prototyping ability um, it's something we've used a fair bit on this car. We've, we've mentioned it before with things like the rear light bezel, so I can show you some of the progress on those. So yeah, moving back to the exterior um, we haven't really talked much about the the front end details on the car <clears throat> we mentioned previously about the rear lights um, and that kind of refers back to that scanning and prototyping that's so accessible these days um, if you remember probably showing in the last episode we had the rear end around where the rear lights go 3d scanned on the car so we could use that scan data to create a rear lamp bezel um, now we had a 3D print done so we could test the fit of those um, which was successful um, and we've now had the final items machined from solid brass billet. Um, the fit up of these is just exceptional. It's at a level you, where it really is worth the effort on the 3D print because it is like fraction of a millimetre perfect fit to the body. Um, We've done them in brass just because it chromes very nicely. So the next thing is these are going to get sent away for chrome. Now there's already a big batch of chrome for this away. We've split the chrome on this into two areas because there were some items which we hadn't finished, um, like these for instance, um, but there were quite a few things chrome-wise that would hold up progress in other areas. So for instance, the door frames, they need to be in before we do a lot of the rest of the buildup of the internals on the door. So we've got one batch of chrome away now, which is all the things that would hold up other progress. Um, and then a second batch, which we'll send away when we've had these front grills machined, uh, which will include these and the main grill. So on the subject of those other grills, um, the small grills here, they, as I've mentioned earlier, are now air intakes. They would have originally had the horns mounted behind them. Um, and there was uh, an, a grill that went over those horns originally on a Mark II. Now we looked at those grills and quite liked the design of them, except the slats seemed a bit close together. So as a, a very crude initial mock-up, we just hacked every other slat out of one of these original grills. 
so we could just offer it up and go, mm, yeah, quite like that. Took a picture of that, sent it to the owner. He was on board with that idea. Um, but we decided that because of the material these are made from, uh, which doesn't lend itself to chroming very nicely, um, and various details of the way they mounted, it wasn't going to be the best route to modify these more neatly. Um, so what we've decided to do is draw up a version of these in CAD. Um, we slightly changed the design of the, the boss in the middle. We've slightly changed the shape of the fins, fin, the fins and slimmed them down a bit. I have to excuse the noise in the background that somebody's sawing next door. Uh, and we've changed the way they mount. We, they're originally mounted in the middle, which obviously means you'd have a visible mounting bracket behind. Um, so we in, in, incorporated mounting points into the edges of it. Um, we drew those, 3D printed a trial one of those, mocked that up. We were happy, owner was happy. So that, they're going to be machined in brass, which is actually being done, I think, probably around about now, if it's probably early next week. Um, and once they're back, they will be added to this second batch of chrome, which also includes the grill. Um, so on the subject of the grill, um, after various um, discussions back and forth about the exact design we were going to go for, we actually settled on wanting a design that was really similar to the original Mark II, except where on the Mark II it has a larger central vein here, which is actually a cast one, and then the slightly smaller um, formed brass veins at the sides. Um, we thought, well, it'd be really nice if they were just all evenly spaced, didn't have that cast one in the middle because we didn't want the badge up here. And then by chance, I realized that that's actually... <laughs> by chance, I realized that's actually exactly what the later Mark I Jags had. Um, so we just set about getting a reasonably good early, uh, sorry, late Mark I Jag you a grill, uh, which we trial fitted it up and it's a perfect fit to the body shape. Um, there is normally a badge that bolts in here, so we're going to just braze those holes up and file those. Um, this one's pretty good as they go. You often find the veins are all at wonky angles on Mark II grills. The only damage on this one is a slight wobble in this vein where the badge is clipped on normally. Um, so we're just going to straighten those out, braze those holes up, and then this is going to go away also to be chromed, and, and that's going to be the final grill. So sometimes with all of this bespoke stuff at our disposal, sometimes the best way to achieve the look you want sometimes is just staring you in the face and is relatively simple. Um, so that's that, and I think that pretty much concludes where we're at. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the next steps on the car. I mean, that first batch of chrome is going to come back. That will allow us to complete all the door builds. Um, in the meantime, we're going to be cracking on with completing all of the engine build-up. The car will be going away at some point over the coming weeks to have the exhaust manifold built. Um, that, as always, is uh, entrusted to Matt Simpson to do the exhaust. Um, on this one, we're going to get him to just do the manifold and we're going to do the system from there back. Um, and then the second batch of chrome, once those brass bits are back, we'll also be finishing off that centre console. So I think the next time we do a video on this, it's probably going to be perilously close to being completed. Very brave of me to say that, <laughs> but, but we've, we've got so many ducks in a row, as it were, with a lot of it, that actually the visible progress is going to be quite fast once we start bolting and installing all of the bits that we've already planned and made. Um, so I think we're going to be left with a few little straggling jobs, um, you know, the, the remaining chrome batch, etc. But what I'm hoping is we can get to the point of the car being complete and able to run and drive. And even if we don't have some of the finishing bright work at the end, we can at least do some of the basic testing at that point anyway. So yeah, really, really excited to see it transform from this stage to rolling, which I think the next time we do a video like this, it will be rolling and hopefully have a lot of the rest of the parts uh, installed. So I look forward to showing you that next time. We're doing a workout video today. <laughs>